Last night, they're going to be looking at the book of Jonah itself, but we're actually going to be spending two weeks after this week studying what Jesus says about Jonah and what the Bible says about Nineveh elsewhere, namely in the book of Nahum. So that'll be the next two weeks that will be coming down the pike after we finish up this last chapter in Jonah. But we'll be reading that last chapter in Jonah, Jonah chapter 4. And the title of this week's message is called Schooled by Grace. Jonah is about to get schooled by God in Grace 101. God has just forgiven the city of Nineveh, much to Jonah's chagrin and bitterness. And God has to really teach him a lesson here. So turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Jonah. It's on page 503 in the church Bibles. And we're going to be starting in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, the fact that Nineveh was forgiven. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose... God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the right hand from their left and also much cattle? End of story. How many of y'all have had a bad dream? Most of us probably have. I recently just had a horrifying dream. I will not disclose the details of such a dream because it's ghastly, but I just remember being in the midst of this dream. And if you've ever had a bad dream, throughout the entirety of the dream, you're thinking to yourself, this is reality. This is happening to me and you're terrified because of what's going on in this dream you think is actually happening to you in your own life. But then you wake up from the dream. All the sweat that's coming off of your body quickly dispels because you know that your dream was actually not reality. And a peace just cascades over your entire being. It's an amazing feeling, right? Not the dream, but waking up from it. But with the prophet Jonah here in chapter 4, his worst nightmare has become a reality. Jonah feared that the Ninevites would be forgiven. That was his nightmare. His worst nightmare was that God would show his unmerited favor on these unbelieving sinners who were a perennial enemy of Israel. And God did the very thing that he was horrified of. I'd like to divide Jonah chapter 4 into two primary sections, brought to you by the wonderful Josh Hecker. 
You got such green eyes in this picture, man. It's nice, like the green goblet. Look good, man. But I'd like to divide this up into two primary sections. The first of which is God's character. God's character in verses one through four. Jonah identifies who God is in his gracious, loving, compassionate nature. We see that in verses one through four. The second section that I want to divide up this text into is God's class. God's class in verses five through 11. Now when I say God's class here, I'm not saying that God is a classy guy or that God is in a class all of his own. What I mean by that is this. God is about to take Jonah to school and teach him a lesson about what grace and favor is and what it entails. That's what I mean by God's class. We see that in verses 5 through 11. But first off, let's look at God's character in verses 1 through 4. Verse 1. But it, the fact that Nineveh was forgiven, displeased Jonah exceedingly. It ticked him off. But these wicked people were shown God's favor. Many of you probably have a footnote in your Bibles, the number one or maybe the letter A or something in the the church Bibles, it's a number one. But if you scroll down to the bottom of the page there in 503, the Hebrew actually reads that the fact that Nineveh was forgiven was exceedingly evil to Jonah. It was evil that God had chosen to show grace to these evil people. That's how messed up Jonah's theology is in this moment. We've seen all throughout this narrative that Jonah is up and down, up and down, up and down in regards to his theological convictions about God and who he is. He's accurate sometimes, but then he's wildly inaccurate. And maybe you're like this in your own life sometimes. You think one thing about God and then you turn to the Bible and that thought that you just had about him is completely obliterated. That's a good thing when that happens because our job is to conform our mind to who God is and not to impose our own agenda upon the text like Jonah is doing here. It was exceedingly evil to Jonah that these people were forgiven and he was angry. Verse two, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, Is this what I said? Is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? He prays to the Lord, but really what he's doing is protesting to the Lord. He's shaking at his fist at heaven and saying, God, I told you so. I knew you would forgive these wicked people when they repented. And it would have been better for me to just stay amongst my own people in my own country rather than come all the way to Nineveh to see you shed grace that I don't want to see shed upon these folk. Jonah is in love with the comfortability that comes from staying even in his own country. He did not want to go to Nineveh. He did not want to be around people that were different than him. He did not want to be around people that he perceived were more wicked than him. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. That's the song that Jonah is singing. I'm not leaving. I'm staying. And we see out of Jonah here a type of religious ethnocentrism. You guys ever heard that word before in class, maybe? Ethnocentrism? Ethnocentrism is thinking that your own culture is better than another culture. That's what ethnocentrism is. So while Jonah is singing, perhaps, sweet land of liberty, I wish I could just stay in my own place and not have to go around these people who look different than me, maybe sound different than me, they have different religions than me, what he should have been saying in his own heart is, I'm depraved too. I'm wicked too. My heart is not any greater than these people that are over in Nineveh. He should have been singing, my country tis of the sweet land of depravity. My heart's just as wicked as these people who don't deserve God's favor. I don't deserve it either. We see this type of bitterness rising up in Jonah's heart. But the amazing thing is, beloved, is that when God sheds his grace upon a certain person 
or ethnic group or country or whatever it is, when he sheds his grace upon somebody, that grace is equal. He saves to the uttermost all those who come to him. Whether you live in Jerusalem or Nineveh or Menominee. Therefore, the dividing wall of hostility has been torn down by God's grace that has been shown us in Christ. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, when it says that for he, Christ, he himself is our peace. He's declared peace, Jonah, by grace, through faith, through repentance. He himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jonah, why are you still hostile to those Ninevites who have just placed their faith in me? And I ask you, dear Christian, this evening, why are you still hostile, perhaps, to other Christians who have placed their faith in him? Why do you hold grudges against fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who have received the same unmerited favor that you have? If God forgave them, you should too. The dividing wall of hostility has been torn down. Why? That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. You are no longer two separate ethnic identities. You are one identity in Christ. So making peace. That he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Not only has he broken down that dividing wall of hostility, but he has killed it and stomped its guts out on the ground. Why are you hostile to other believers? There's no room for that, Jonah. There's no room whatsoever. But he carries on, verse 2. He said, That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Why? For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Man, Jonah's theology, again, is like this. He just said it was evil for God to forgive these people. But then he makes one of the most accurate declarations of God's gracious character that we can find in the entire Bible. In fact, he almost says verbatim what God says to Moses when he reveals his character to him in Exodus chapter 34. As we read this text, listen and see if it sounds familiar to what Jonah just said here in verse 2. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He proclaimed his character to him. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Almost exactly what Jonah said here. But he forgets to include this last part. Conveniently for him. God also is a God who keeps steadfast love for thousands, and he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Jonah just nicks that from his Bible, as it were. He did a little men in black memory erase in regards to that passage in the Bible. God, Jonah forgives people. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin when people place their faith in him. Don't conveniently forget that. But he does. He does. Jonah did not believe that God was as gracious as he says that he was in the Bible. And this begs the question, beloved, what attributes of God do you not like? Like Jonah did not like God's unmerited favor that he chooses to bestow on people that he chooses to bestow it upon. Do you wish that God wouldn't forgive this certain person or this people group or this certain race or religion because you don't like God's love for the nations? Or do you not like God's sovereignty and his providence 
The doctrine that God is in control of everything that comes to pass and that everything that comes to pass has been ordained by God to come to pass because he is the one ordaining it to come to pass. Does that scare you? Does that intimidate you into believing, man, I, I'm just not as in control of my life like I thought I once was? Or perhaps, do you not like the justice and the wrath of God upon impenitent sinners who refuse to place their faith in him? And the fact that an eternal hell awaits those who obey not the gospel and embrace not the truth of it. Do you not like that about God either? Because our job as Christians is to embrace God as he is and as he reveals himself to be in this book. Our job is not to create God in our image. But our God and our job, our job is to take God on his own terms as he is and worship him as such and conform your mind to his truth and who he says he is in this book. So that leads us into our second section here, the class, Grace 101, that God takes Jonah through here in verses 5 through 11. Jonah went out of the city, in verse 5, and he sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Why is Jonah still going outside the city to watch what happens to the city? Jonah is still hoping that God will burn down the city of Nineveh just like he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's his hope. That's his prayer. And he's hoping that God will relent from his relenting. He's hoping that God will double back and actually cast down his wrath and his judgment upon these people. So he goes out and he builds kind of a makeshift booth that really isn't effective whatsoever as we see in the following verse. Verse 6, it says, The Lord God appointed a plant and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. <laughs> this makeshift shack that Jonah has just built for himself is not very effective. And God has to come in and show him grace, just like the grace he's shown to the Ninevites, so that he can be relieved from his discomfort. But as it stands currently, Jonah is sitting outside the city hoping that it will burn down. Jonah's theology is like this. He doesn't understand that God's character is gracious and patient like we see here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach, uh, that all should reach repentance. That's his desire. For the nation. And Jonah doesn't get it. Instead, he is bitter and it's leading to his own destruction. We see here in this text that when man is bitter, when mankind is bitter, man is actually really pathetic. Man's really pathetic. You ever made some dumb decisions when you were mad? Or angry? Or bitter? You're seething against somebody? What good comes of that? Nothing. I remember when I was down in Texas and I was youth pastoring down there, I was so frustrated with the situation that was going on in our ministry that as soon as all the students left on a Wednesday night, I wanted to take our glass water jug that was sitting in the youth room that all the students would get water from, and I wanted to take that massive glass jug and I wanted to throw it on the ground so I could watch it burst apart everywhere. And I sat down before I was about to do this, and I thought to myself, what good would that do? I just have to clean up this glassy heap of sin that I had just thrown on the ground. I would make my life even worse. Jonah is making his bitter life even worse by not accepting what God has chosen to do for these people people. When we try to cover up our sin with our own little man-made machinations, to try to hide our bitterness, 
to try to hide our sin, to try to hide our rebellion against God and our bitterness towards him. It never works out very well. And we see that in the picture of this shack that Jonah has just pitifully made for himself. We also see it in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. As soon as Eve grabs the apple and bites it and Adam sits by and does nothing, it says that the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They knew that they were shameful. They knew that their sin had just been exposed by God. And what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loincloths. They took tree leaves and tried to cover up themselves and make loincloths so that the God of the universe couldn't see their nakedness. How effective is that, you think? Your bitterness and your sin and your hostility towards God never profits. But even in Genesis chapter 3, we see that God condescends to Adam and Eve. And he creates a covering for them by grace alone. He provides an animal sacrifice that is actually sufficient to cover them. And that animal sacrifice, that blood, flesh sacrifice that covers them, is actually a type and shadow of the greatest sacrifice to come. Jesus Christ, who covers our sin and our nakedness. But when we try to cover ourselves, and we try to hide ourselves from God, like Jonah did, like Adam and Eve did here, it profits nothing. Moving on here in the text. We see that God uses four particular objects to get across this lesson that he wants Jonah to learn. He uses a plant, a worm, a sun, and the wind to show him that it is by grace that Jonah is even allowed and afforded the opportunity to participate in these things, to participate in the comfort that God gives him through these things. And it's his mercy to give, and it's his mercy to take as well, if he is pleased to take it from somebody. The Lord has given, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what Job prays in Job chapter 1. And that's something that Jonah is not getting here yet. But it's something that we must understand here, A-Y, as a youth group. The fact that God gives mercy to whom he sees fit. It is his to give and he owes it to no man. He owes it to no woman. It is grace. And if he owed grace to everybody and he gave it to everybody, then that grace would actually be justice because he owes it to people. And a good, just God owes something if he gives it to everybody. But grace, by definition, is something that you cannot earn or deserve or merit for yourself. And we see the Apostle Paul teach us in Romans chapter 9, quoting again from the book of Exodus, for he, God, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I will have mercy and compassion on Nineveh if I want to. That's up to me. I'll have mercy on you in this youth room if I choose to. That's up to me. If you're in this room tonight believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, it's because God has chosen to show compassion to you and he does not show that same compassion in a saving way to everybody. Be grateful for grace. Be grateful, Jonah. Be grateful, Nineveh, that God showed and decided and ordained to give you that grace from before the foundation of the world. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion or a human choice, but it depends on God who has and shows and gives the mercy. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. That's also God's sovereign prerogative. Jonah learns this lesson, and then the book of Jonah is over. And it leaves such a weird taste in your mouth. It should, because Jonah is still just as bitter 
at the end of this book as he was at the beginning. That's a tragedy, y'all. Don't just be grateful for the grace that you have received in your life, but be grateful for the grace that God shows to others as well. Don't just praise God for your own salvation. Praise God for the salvation of others. The salvation of people in other churches. The salvation of others in other cities, states, countries, parts of the world. Praise God for the salvation of all people who receive it. How Jonah should have responded is very similar to how Peter and the Jews respond in Acts chapter 11. And I want us to turn there here briefly. In Acts chapter 11, we're going to be looking at our last text for this evening. <clears throat> the book of Acts, specifically chapter 11, is on page 598 in your church Bible. If you don't have a church Bible, it's in the New Testament. And it's after the book of John and before the book of Romans. Acts chapter 11, verses 15 through 18. Peter is reporting to the Jews, who were the people of God, just like Jonah was a member of the people of God. He's reporting to them how God has chosen to save the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the Ninevites, as it were. And this is evidenced forth by the fact that in chapter 10, God chose to save Cornelius and his Gentile household. One chapter before, Acts chapter 11, that's what happened. And he's recounting what has just happened and how God has chosen to save the Gentiles to these Jewish Christians here in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 11, verse 15. He's recounting this event. He's recounting this experience. He says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, these Gentiles, just as it did on us at the beginning at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how Jesus had said that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now notice just how radically different Peter's response is to the fact that these people are now being saved. in relation to how Jonah responded. Verse 17. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I? Who was I that I could stand in God's way? Jonah's trying to stand in God's way, isn't he? Peter will have none of it. Verse 18. When they heard these things, the Jewish Christians, when they heard these things, they fell silent. Their mouths were stopped before God. But then they opened up their mouths and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Jonah should have been praising God for the fact that he granted repentance to these people. That's what Peter and the Jewish Christians are doing. Do you praise God that God forgives even the most wretched, wicked sinners? I pray that you do. And I also pray that you are thinking of people in your own mind who you need to show grace to and who you need to show forgiveness to perhaps even brothers and sisters in Christ, even in this room tonight, whom you still have the dividing wall of hostility built up against them. Don't be like Jonah. Be like Peter in your response to God's grace. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, if any man or woman be in Christ, it is solely because you have granted them repentance unto life. May we not respond to this reality like Jonah did, but may we respond like Peter and the Jewish Christians did. And God, if there be any hostility within this room, 
from these students towards other students. If there be any hostility, even in this church, from some congregation members to other congregation members. God, may you make these things known to them in their hearts, and may you break down and kill that dividing wall of hostility that has been broken down in Christ. We praise you for the story of Jonah and how it still affects our day-to-day living. And may we not grow calloused to the grace that has been shown to us just like it was shown to the Ninevites of Jonah's day. We pray these things in your name, King Jesus.